Go Dodgers. Jay Park's podcast. Exclusively on Lee's Coast Radio. If you don't know what Staten Island is, it's like New York's abortion that live. Representing Staten Island. We Staten Island boys are no joke. of ever turning into an autocracy or some sort of authoritarian regime when you have a fascist regime on the rise right now, unchecked by Congress, which makes November the most important election of our lives. Jay Pork's Least Coast Radio dies in your house. Jay Pork's podcast. We must resist or we won't exist. Taking it back in November. Least Coast Radio for the least third voices. Hey yo, what is the word, people? Welcome back into another action-packed edition of the Jay Porks Podcast. I am Jay Porks, with me as always on the other side of the glass, making sure this is a well-oiled podcast machine. Every week is the ever-popular nobody who is somehow, someway, learning how to fade the music out instead of taking a just straight stop, and I love it. That is the Meat Puppets on the intro. That song's called Crazy. That's off their album Huevos. And it also describes the times right now. Not the jobs part, but the, the crazy part. It, it's crazy. 
got myself a job. I don't have myself a job. The only job I have is defending democracy. Twice a week, in front of my computer, and every single second of the day on the internet. Because as the Russian trolls are spreading disinformation, or DEZA as they call it, I am over here spreading truth. Because, you know, I'm not good at lying, really. And because truth is going to lead us to victory. The truth will lead us to a victory. So, in case you don't know, I'm Jay Porks. I have a podcast channel here called Least Coast Radio. It's for the least heard voices. I say the least heard voices because, you know, my voice is so sultry. And not enough people are listening. And, you know, I, I think I think people should. So, we started our own channel. We're going to generate some, some, some traffic over here. And what I would like you to do is, if you're not someone who's done it yet, I would say, please, tell a friend... And why don't you go to Twitter and go to Least Coast Radio and follow us there. And if you have the podcast app or if you have YouTube, find Least Coast Radio on there and karate chop that subscribe button, man. That's what you got to do for me. And then you can get updated. Keep keep up to date on all things J Pork's podcast. And every Friday, this is fairly new. It's not fairly new anymore. I think we've been doing it for a year already. Wow. Uh, every Friday, we have an episode, a new podcast. It's called Dies in Your House. It's a play off my last name. And yes, I'm very upset that it took me five years to think of it. But um, it's a shorter podcast. It's limited to about, you know, less than a half hour. Easily digestible. And usually is the, pre, the pre-show, the post-show, and the prelude. To what this is, the main event, the Jay Porks podcast, here on Least Coast Radio. For the least third voices. Did I tell you about Patreon? If you go to patreon.com forward slash Jay Porks, you can figure out how to help us out here on the podcast. Help us fight democracy. Help us keep this going. Just let us know you're here. And if you're listening, tweet at me. Be like, yo, Jay, I'm listening. At Jay Porks on Twitter. Just look for me and say, hey, Jay. I'm listening. Cool. Or you can even be like, hey, Jay, you suck. Either way, it's fine with me. I like interaction. This week. Do you think it's been a do you think it's been a slow week? Or has it been a bit been a big week? It's always a big week. So this week, I'm going to talk a little bit more about our two princes, Mohammed bin Salman and Jared Kushner, and how the right-wing media is serving as the spin doctors. We're also going to talk about the latest in the Mueller... It's not, it's not actually the Mueller probe. We're going to talk about the latest in Russian meddling in our elections, and it was in 2016. This year, the midterms, we've caught... Russians trying to sow disinformation, discord in our in our nation. And we're going to talk about that later. I've got an article to read to you. Got a lot of things going. And also, I mean, if we have time, if we have time at the end, we will talk about um, the, the Connors and how they got the message on the, on the opioid crisis, how they totally missed the message. And we're going to talk about that later. But first, we're going to take care of some serious business. So we've got, we've got a couple of related things here. But I just don't want to, I don't want to miss out. And I don't want to let you guys forget that there is large amounts of voter suppression happening. A bus full of, uh black senior citizens was stopped on their way to early voting and they were like not told that they can't vote why we don't know we have voter registration forms being tossed out in Georgia North Dakota they're not letting Native Americans get voter IDs they're making them jump through hoops to get it this is more of a reason for people like me and you who know where our polling place is and are registered to vote 
to go out and vote and put a check on this crazy White House. We need to get out there and vote. And you need to ignore the polls. Because a little story that came out was, I saw a tweet from John Harwood that said, that said Sinclair is the cancer of journalism. And he says that fairly because the New Yorker is reporting that employees at the Sinclair Broadcast Group, the largest owner of television stations in the United States, say that the company orders them to air biased political segments and that it feeds interviewers questions intended to favor Republicans. And that's the New Yorker reporting. And you would remember that John Oliver did a big thing on Sinclair Broadcasting a couple of weeks ago. And you will remember they had that... They were all reading that hostage statement about false news. Remember that? Again, this is the news. The news is not supposed to be a biased place. So now you have Sinclair Broadcasting. Again, I mean, they own... They're the owner of the most television stations across the country. And they all have local news. And they run biased reporting. And they have questions that favor Republicans. Which might... Which might result in polling errors. Which might result in faulty polling. Because not for nothing, when you see a poll where, like, it says 660... A poll of about 660 likely voters. What exactly does that mean? 660? That's your sample size? We got the internet. We have Twitter. Take a poll, man. So we have Sinclair Broadcasting pumping Republican-leaning news into towns in middle America and, you know, along the coast as well. And they're spreading this message. And they're giving, you know, favorable questions to Republicans. Which means if they have a Republican congressman on, they're going to treat him like gold. Did you see the way Laura Ingram was making faces at Denna Grayson the other day? Dr. Denna Grayson was on Laura and Ingram's show. The Ingram Factor or some whatever, whatever the hell it's called. I don't even know what it's called. But I watched the video that Dr. Denna Grayson, our friend on, well, you, you know, our friend on Twitter here. And, uh, you know, I, I was watching her answer the question. And as she was giving her response, Lauren Ingram's face just scrunched. And I was just like, do you have any respect? Like, you had, you could have not had the progressive on the show. You didn't have to. But the problem is, is that it's not that. These places are unbi like are biased journalism. It's that they actually try to feed you the line that they're unbiased and they're just reporting the facts. Couldn't be further from the truth. All of these Sinclair stations have a listen. Every station has an agenda, but most of them don't include who is in the White House. Okay. But play Sinclair Broadcasting, Fox News, Breitbart. These are part of the right-wing spin doctor conspiracy to plunge this clown, this orange wannabe despot cunt monkey, into the White House. Free coverage. Every day. The media is as complicit in this. As anyone. The media. Jim Comey. Bernie Sanders. 
They're all Jill Stein, Gary Johnson. They are all guilty when democracy falls. And I said this. I said this on Dies in Your House on Friday. And I don't mean to sound like, you know, the total single issue voter here, but listen, I'm rolling up my sleeves and I'm going to try my, I'm going to do everything in my power to fix democracy. But in 2020, if the GOP still exists and still has power, I'm going to Canada. They got legal pot there. Not in, not, and it's not like they have legal pot in, you know, seven parts of Canada, not like America. You know, federally legal, everybody. Because, you know, that's what you should do if you want to make money. And if you want to keep shit out of the hands of kids. Listen, I'm doing all I could every week. Twice a week, I'm on this podcast fighting for democracy, fighting for this country, speaking truths, telling you what you need to know, letting you know that it really doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat right now. Because in November, in the midterms, you need to vote Democrat to get our country back to normal. The Republicans' message right now is that the Democrats are a mob. Well, I say let's mob the polls with votes. Not only that, but anyone see the irony in Trump standing in front of an angry mob calling, you know, Nancy Pelosi the leader of an angry mob? I mean, Nancy Pelosi... Elizabeth Warren, Susan Collins, not Susan Collins, uh, what's her name? Feinstein. They're both short with brown hair. Is that like, these are the people that Republicans fear? A bunch of grandmas? I, I don't understand it. And they use key with hot words like socialism. They want to bring socialism to the country. It's already here, dick. It's already here in terms of Medicare. It's already here in terms of how we pay city workers. So, shut up. You shouldn't be allowed to talk about things that you don't know about. And no, this is not where you scream into the speaker, Then why do you have this podcast, Jay? That's not, that, that was not an invitation. You're, this is not, I wasn't asking for participation at, at that, at that juncture there. So, shh. shh. Keep it shut. If you don't know shit about something, maybe you shouldn't be talking about it. Socialism, an angry mob. Ugh. My head hurts. And we have a little over two weeks. And as a Democrat, I am aware that if any group of politicians can blow something, if any group of politicians can blow something, can ruin something, can have something on lock, and then not, it's the Democrats. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep it together for two more weeks. And then we're going to go vote. Don't look at a poll. That's going to seep into your subconscious. And then when it seeps into your subconscious, you're going to think, oh, well, if, if uh, Nate Silver says that, you know, the Democrats have this much of a chance of taking the house, then, you know, maybe I can not go to the polls. No, Lyft is offering free rides to your polling place. Don't miss out. Download the Lyft app. Free rides to your polling place. Let's, 
Let's put let's put this fire out before it burns down the house. Okay. Let's talk about two princes when we come back after this. Hey yo, J Pork's here, back to record my own commercials. And here's the deal. You may have heard me complaining on today's podcast or a previous podcast about suffering through a summer of unemployment. Well, we have a we have a fix for that, and it is called Patreon. That's right. Least Coast Radio now has a Patreon page. And all you need to do is go to patreon.com slash jporks. And there are three tiers that you can subscribe to. Three tiers you can join to become a member of Least Coast Radio, of the, of the Least Coast Radio community, of Porks Nation. You'll even have a chance to pick the name and all that stuff. And we are talking, we are not offering just thank yous and shout outs. We got bonus content. There is even a tier where you are able to talk to me on the phone every week. And we will go over what is happening in our country. And you could personally talk to me, Jay Pork. Personal interactions. There's a tier where there's a group. You can join a group and we could, it, you could affect where the podcast goes that week. I need a community. I need help. Not necessarily money, but I need people to be helping me out. So therefore, that's why I created a Least Coast Radio Patreon. Not to be confused with a GoFundMe or a Kickstarter. This is not me with my hand out. I have bonus content. Bonus, bonus, bonus content to offer you. I have tons of it. I have tons of time, and I want to give it to you. All you need to do is join Join us on Patreon. Become a Patreon. Patreon.com slash jporks. Look for the Least Coast Radio Patreon page. You'll see me. You'll see me in, with a microphone and dies in my house. Dies in your house next to the name. You'll see that. So just go hit us on Patreon. You will get a thank you. I will re- I will know that and you will get on. You will have a lot to do with what goes down on the jporks podcast and everything. Concerned with Least Coast Radio. It's going to be a big year for us. 2018. Let's get it done. The main the main story, of course, is the murder of a journalist. That's what's still that's what's still uh, creeping into your news cycle because day by day, new little details come out, new lies come out from Saudi Arabia, from the White House. And I'm just, I'm just waiting for truths. So this week, Saudi Arabia admitted that Khashoggi is dead. And he died as the result of a fight. A fight with a bone saw? The, the guy was dismembered. To even pass that along to us. And think that anybody is going to buy that is completely and utterly ridiculous. Rogue killers. Now, let's talk about Jamal Khashoggi. He's a family man. He's a journalist speaking truth to power. Outspoken against the regime over there. You know, in Saudi Arabia and the countries over there. Outspoken. Documenting human rights violations wrongdoings by all accounts this guy's a a great person he really is now i'm not saying he's like you know granting you know he's not john cena granting wishes at the make a wish foundation you know he's not you know hanging out in hospitals reading stories to cancer patients and stuff like that but he's got a family he lives in america lived in America, and he's dead. And the U.S. government doesn't seem to give a crap about how that happened. They just want us to stop talking about it. And we're not going to stop talking about it. But, like, as much of a man, as much of, like, a, a, a guy who speaks truth to power and, you know, goes to these countries and takes on these dangerous assignments, he's not... 
Jason Bourne. He's not Jack Reacher. And Rogue Killers is a ridiculous theory that should, you know, one, just say it. Say it right now to yourself. I'll give you a second. Say Rogue Killers. Say that. Don't you sound like an idiot when you say things like that? What is this? Swordfish? How many movies? I mean, how much executive time is spent watching action flicks? Rogue Killers did it. Yeah. I believe that. But this this brings us to an early, an early edition of the Thread Count. Because for more, for more on Saudi Arabia, Mohammed Bonesaw Salam, Salman, and Jamal Khashoggi, we are going to turn to our buddy, our close personal friend, who remember, wrote a book called Dirty Rubles, which is an introduction to Trump Russia. It's like a pro- it's a primer. It gives it lays it out why. If you say, oh, well, that's utterly ridiculous. The book Dirty Rubles will explain to you how not ridiculous it is. And then what you could do is you can go watch Active Measures, the documentary, get a visual, and then you could say to yourself, I don't believe what's going on in our country. But Greg Oliar wrote a book, Dirty Rubles, and he came on my podcast, on our podcast, because this isn't just my podcast, this is your podcast. This is the podcast for anybody that wants sane government. Anybody that wants to go back to normalcy. Anybody that supports progressive policies. This is your podcast. This is not only mine. I come on here and I vent. But this is it's as much you as it is me. So he came on with us. And we chopped it up for about an hour. And his Twitter is like if you took, if you sent a text message with not one, not two, three fire emojis. Okay, three. Three fire emojis because it's lit. Threads after threads. So we'll get into an early edition of the thread count with our buddy Greg Oliar. And we're talking MBS. And we're talking Jared Kushner, or as one, or as an article in the uh, I I don't know what pa- I forgot what paper it was. I think Phil Rucker wrote it. The headline was two princes speaking of Jared Kushner and MBS. If they're the two princes, then the right wing media are the spin doctors. Yeah. I did that. That was good. And I'm mad that when I tweeted that, it didn't get liked or anything. So I said it now. If Kushner... I just want to get the joke across again. It's very funny. If Kushner and MBS are two princes, then the right-wing media are the spin doctors. All right. Let's get to this... uh early edition of the thread count here in the jpox podcast okay let's get this let's get this show on the road here as we get the music going for this early edition of the thread count this comes from greg oliar you can follow him on twitter at greg oliar so this one is titled let's do another thread about kushner khashoggi mbs and trump And it begins. Overview. The 30-something Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, became heir apparent in 2016. Although he began his regime with a series of modest, if widely publicized reforms, these were designed to disguise his true despotic aims. Jamal Khashoggi was a Saudi journalist critical of MBS, who portrayed himself who portrayed him as the tyrant he is at heart. For this, MBS had Khashoggi brutally murdered. Jared Kushner 
It's chummy with MBS. Donald Trump is a staunch supporter. Staunch supporter. Both men have ulterior motives, motives for siding with MBS. Timeline. As I sip my coffee. Sorry about that. Timeline. April 2017. Charles Kushner, father of Jared, asked Qatar for a loan to bail out the troubled property at 666 Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. The Qataris turn him down. June 2017. So wait, uh, that timeline April 2017. Jared Kushner's father asked Qatar for money for to bail out 666 Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. He gets turned down. One month later, April, no, two months later, May, June, June 2017, Saudi Arabia organizes a blockade of Qatar, a country where the U.S. has a major military base. Kushner leads the support, Kushner, Kushner leads the extreme minority view in the West Wing to support the blockade. To the, to the, conster, to the consternation of the State Department, Donald Trump praises the move. June 2017, still in June 20. After his criticism of Trump gets him banned from Saudi media, Jamal Khashoggi leaves the kingdom for the Beltway. The Beltway being uh, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, over there. September 2017, Jamal Khashoggi begins writing for the Washington Post. October 2017, Jared Kushner pays an unannounced visit to Rita, where he... It's, it's the town in Saudi Arabia. R-I-Y-A-D-H. Not trying it. Rita's good with me. Where he stays up until the wee hours talking, quote, strategy with Crown Prince MBS. His new BFF. He reportedly gives MBS an enemies list called from the classified presidential daily brief, or PDB, as they call it on the cable news. October. 2017. Still, Kushner's company receives a $57 million loan from a subsidiary of SoftFund, the Saudi investment concern, to bail out its troubled property at One Journal Square in Jersey City. That's hat tip to DC Poll. At DC Poll had that info. November 2017. MBS orchestrates a purge of the disloyal of the disloyal, imprisoning members of the royal family who oppose him and seizing their considerable assets. The most prominent is Prince Al Walid bin Talal, the 45th richest man in the world and a Trump foil. Khashoggi later reports that the amount seized from Al Walid's is $110 billion, the same amount as the proposed U.S. Saudi arms deal. August 2018. A Qatari-funded investment company grants the bailout loan to the Kushners. October 2018. U.S. intelligence community become aware of a plot by MBS to lure Khashoggi back to the kingdom and there to detain him. Trump and Kushner are almost certainly told of this. Neither lift a finger to help the journalist. Jamal Khashoggi goes to Saudi to the Saudi consulate in Istanbul to secure documents that would allow him to marry his fiance, a Turkish national. He is detained, and a Saudi kill squad with intimate ties to MBS tortures him, kills him, and dismembers his body. The Turks announce that they have recordings of all this. An initial report that the recording was made by Khashoggi's Apple Watch is a cover, as the Turks had the consulate bugged. First, Saudi Arabia denied any wrongdoing. After days of hand-wringing, they finally admit that yes, he died in the consulate, and they are investigating. Trump suggests the assassination was the work of, quote, rogue killers. Mike Pompeo flies there, where he and MBS attempt to cook up a plausible cover story. The best they can come up with is that Khashoggi, who was almost 60 years old and not to be confused with Conor McGregor, got into a fist fight with 15 men sent to with the 15 men sent to interrogate him. 
a group that included members of MBS's security de detail and a bone saw bearing autopsy doctor, and Khashoggi died accidentally. Trump and Kushner both accept this obviously fake story at face value. Trump goes to a rally and praises a GOP comrade who got, to ru who got rough with a journalist, implying that if given the chance, he too would welcome the opportunity to murder a reporter he thought was too critical. Conclusion, a despotic regime in Saudi Arabia is boistered by a despotic regime in the United States. The people ruled by Purit puritanical, I got that, the people ruled by a puritanical and retrograde religious sect, women veiled and denied basic rights and privileges, censorship of speech in the press, infidels, including unbelievers, LGBT, dissidents, beheaded, and the vast resources controlled by a small circle of oligarchs. This is Saudi Arabia, Arabia today, and it's what the GOP wants in this country. And if you go to medium.com slash Greg Oliar, you can find way more articles by our buddy. Greg Oliar. So, exactly. I mean, he's not he's not Conor McGregor. He ain't Jason Bourne. He ain't Jack Reacher. He's not whatever that whatever character Tom Cruise plays in Mission Impossible. He's not any of that. He's just a guy that wanted to get some papers to marry his wife and a journalist who was speaking truth to power. And we as Americans, we don't accept that. We're not going to let a despotic regime rise here. That's why, and I'll say this every sentence I get, that's why November 6th is so important. You have to go out there and vote. Because the things we care about, like, you know, I mean, we could talk about individual policies and stuff like that. Or we can just talk about the fact that we don't want to live in a despotic regime. We don't want America to become the autocracy, kleptocracy, authoritarian, fascist regime that the current GOP wants it to become. Now, the good news is, is that the House of Representatives, every seat is up for re-election. You can literally replace the entire House of Representatives. Those who represent you can be replaced. So we have to go vote on November 6th. Because if we don't vote, I mean, other countries might vote for us. Not vote for us. Other countries might be doing the voting for us. And those countries might contain places like Siberia, Moscow. Those countries might be Russia. Speaking of Russia, you like you like the segue there, right? It was right from treason to treason. So, Russian national a charge. Russian national charged with attempting to interfere in 2018 midterm elections. That's right. We are not done yet. Active measures continue into 2018, into the midterms. Now, uh, there is a charge. Here we go. A 44-year-old St. Petersburg woman, Elena Alexey... Alexey... That was my... Pardon me. That was my alarm going off. Telling me to wake up. I've been up for three hours already recording this. Um, okay, let's get back to this. Elena Alex Savina Kushyanova. That's a good one. Let's do that again. Elena Alexiv Alexivna Kushyanova Kushyanova Kushyanova. Anyhow, she's charged with conspiracy to defraud the United States for managing the, 
the financing of a social media troll operation that included the Internet Research Agency, which special counsel Robert Mueller's investigators charged with crimes earlier this year. Prosecutors who unsealed the criminal complaint Friday say she aided the Russian effort to inflame passions online related to immigration, gun control, and the Second Amendment, the Confederate flag, race relations, LGBT issues, the Women's March, and the National Anthem debate from December 2016 until May 2018. The social media efforts specifically focused on the shootings of church members in Charleston, South Carolina, and concert attendees in Las Vegas, Nevada. The Charlottesville Unite the Right rally, which one, which left one counter-protester dead, and police shootings of African American men, the complaint says. The criminal charge says the Russians' online manipulation effort focused on multiple political viewpoints and candidates, but frequently zeroed in on the Republican Party's well-known leaders. In one effort to spread an online news article about the late Senator John McCain's position on border wall to stop illegal immigration, an alleged conspirator directed others to brand McCain as an old geezer. They also attempted to paint House Speaker Paul Ryan as a complete, absolute nobody incapable of any decisiveness, and a, quote, two-faced loudmouth. I'm going to pause for a second. Paul Ryan is a complete and absolute nobody incapable of any deci decisiveness. That is Paul Ryan. That's accurate. They aimed other efforts at stories about Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, and Mitch McConnell pushed to fully support Donald Trump and called Mueller a, quote, puppet of the establishment, according to the complaint. The effort had an operating budget of $35 million, prosecutors said, and was allegedly funded by Russian oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin. I think I got that right. Prigozhin and his companies. Prigozhin has not responded to a criminal charge he faces from Mueller for funding the scheme before the 2016 election. Quote, the conspiracy had a strategic goal, which continues to this day, to sow division and discord in the U.S. political system, including by, cre including by creating social and political polarization, undermining faith in de democratic institutions, and influencing U.S. elections, including the upcoming 2018 midterm election. The criminal complaint in the Eastern District of Virginia said Friday, the online scheme directed some of its proponents to, quote, effectively aggravate the conflict between minorities and the rest of the population, prosecutors quoted one member of the effort saying. Kusianova also worked with Concord Management and Catering, another defendant in the Mueller probe, to take in funds. Concord is represented by lawyers in the U.S. and is the only Russian defendant to plead not guilty so far. Kushinova has not been previously charged with a crime. Federal authorities issued a warrant for her arrest on September 28th, but it had been kept secret for three weeks. Since then, it would not derail, quote, other government efforts to dispute foreign influence efforts. A court filing Friday said. Prosecutors did not elaborate. Prosecutors say Kushinova oversaw the financing, budget, budgeting, and expense payments of the of the corporatized propaganda effort called Project Lock Lockta Lockta. I thought it was potato lock. It's like the potato pancakes that you get on Passover. Nonetheless, the money came in from Concord, which received some of its funding from the Russian government to feed school children and the military. Prosecutors allege. The millions of dollars allowed the Russians to buy social media analytics services, secure server space and domain names, and plant online advertisements, and to stage political rallies and protests in the U.S. Sometimes, the Russians would use fake Americanized names like Bertha Malone or Helen Christopherson on Facebook, or handles like at Trump with USA, or Swamp Drainer 659, or USA USA for Trump on Twitter. One account... One Twitter account the group ran, Woke Louisa, amassed 55,000 followers in one year, tweeting about Flint, Michigan's drinking water crisis, and encouraging voters to register in the 2018 midterm elections. 
The monthly budget for Project Latka is frequently approaches $2 million over the last three years. This new case marks the 27th time a Russian has been charged with a crime related to the 2016 election interference or by Mueller, whose mandate is to investigate those crimes. In, other open, in another open case, the Justice Department indicted 12 Russian military intelligence officers for hacking the Democratic Party and the Hillary Clinton campaign and spreading those documents online to influence the election. A, 20, a 26 Russian national was indicted in June alongside now convicted former Trump campaign manager, chairman, Paul Manafort for alleged witness tampering. Typically, criminal cases against Russian nationals hang in the court system with no progress after the initial charge because the European nation does not extradite its citizens to the U.S. when they are charged. The cases in effect allow the U.S. to name and shame defendants as court watchers call the practice. The defendants are unlikely to ever appear in U.S. court. Russian company Concord Management and Catering's not guilty plea in the election propaganda case was an unusual pushback on these types of indictments. Concord's U.S.-based attorneys are fighting the conspiracy charge and have so far unsuccessfully attempted to use the court to challenge Mueller's work and gather information about the investigators' tactics. And that is on CNN. So I got that. I That article was shared by... Um, Dr. Denna Grayson, who I follow on Twitter, and she's folk, she's a focal point of the thread count a lot of weeks. And uh, let's go through her thread following this this article here. Take out the main points. Federal prosecutors indict a Russian woman alleged to be the chief accountant of an ongoing Kremlin campaign to influence the 2018 elections. <clears throat> One major Russian social media theme was to exploit white supremacy, trolling NFL protests against racial pro policing, racist policing, immigration, the Confederate flag, and the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally that killed Heather Heyer in, 20, in 2017. The goal? To inflame and divide us. Pivoting off the right wing, pivoting off a piece by right wing blowhard Michael Savage, the Russians sought to forcefully support Savage's message and any attempt to remove Trump is a direct path to a civil war in the United States. If any Americans conspired with Russia to push this civil war narrative, they should be charged with sedition and treason. The Russians also short, sought to smear John McCain and Marco Rubio. Uh, uh, and Speaker Ryan. Hey, GOP, are you cool with Russians smearing your fellow Republicans, Marco Rubio, Paul Ryan, and departed John McCain? Because I'm a liberal Democrat, and I'm definitely not cool with Russians having any say in our elections. And couldn't be closer to the truth than that. You see what it is? So you might read that story, and you might say to yourself, Jay, they're going after Republicans too. No, they're going after Republicans who might... Challenge Trump in 2020. They go after Republicans who people wanted to vote for until Trump started with his white supremacy message that got 33% of the race, the racist country we live in, out to vote. But it's more important that so Rubio and Jeb Bush are being smeared there. So that means that the Russians think that Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush are viable candidates for 2020. Because Russia is all... Russia doesn't care about the Republican Party. Russia cares about Russia. And Trump cares about Russia. So therefore, Russia cares about Trump. And Trump only. They don't. It's not like Russia doesn't want the Democrats to be in power. They don't care. They want us to hate each other, and they want Trump at the top, so he can put, you know, so any sanctions and stuff, further sanctions, any further indictments, he can be on top of it one way or another. 
give them the heads up, whatever the case may be. So the Russians are already putting feelers out there for 2020. They obviously want to talk Trump into running. Now, he does have a re-election campaign, but I, I don't know. I, and I mentioned on Friday's episode of Dies in Your House, I mentioned how I watch Morning Joe every day. I'm like, Joe Scarborough is convinced that Trump... Not He's not, conv- he's not saying that Trump is going to lose. He's convinced that Trump won't run in 2020. Won't even run. My buddy who I had on my podcast, Greg Oliar, author of the book Dirty Rubles, he says his thoughts are that if impeachment came, that Trump would resign and because and not let the impeachment go through because there's a lot of discovery in that process and you don't want, and he's a, somebody who's embarrassed about things that have happened. I'll take either one of those. Those are two totally different people, two different ends of the spectrum, of the political spectrum. And both of them feel that there will not be a Trump after 2020, that this will not be a thing anymore, whether he doesn't run or whether he resigns or whether he's impeached. And I say, please, please, anything, end this, end this long, strange trip. Because Canada has legalized marijuana for adult use, recreationally. If these midterms don't go, and listen, I'm doing all I can to be a freaking patriot, you know what I'm saying? I'm doing everything I could. I'm talking to people. I'm spreading the word. I'm letting people know about the corruption that's going on, the people that might not be paying attention to it. But at the end of the day, if 2018 doesn't fall the way of the only party that doesn't support locking kids in cages, and if 2020 doesn't fall the way of the only party that is down with, you know, thinking every American should have health care because, you know, Americans shouldn't die and Americans shouldn't go bankrupt when they need to go to the doctor. So if things don't fall for the in the direction of the party that would save America, I'm not quite sure how long I want to stick around to watch it burn. That's all I'm saying. Canada is on the table now. It's on the table. It's legit. Alright. Get into a little more when we come back after this. Ha. Huh. Jay Porks here. And I know I've been a little busy on this Least Coast Radio stuff. Talking about resist, remove. And recreational. But I gotta tell you about one more thing. You. Should. Be. A Least Coast Radiohead. That's right. And you can become a Least Coast Radiohead just by going to patreon.com forward slash jporks. And check out the offers we have there. There's a low tier, a middle tier, and a high tier. All of those get you bonus content, exclusive personalized artwork, and even a chance to interact with me on a personal level over the phone. We could talk about what's going on in this podcast. We could talk about how we are going to flip the seats blue in November. And we are going to vote like this is our final election because it might be. Patreon.com forward slash jpork. Become a Least Coast Radiohead and join the resistance. And we're back. J. Pork's podcast. We're still here. Okay. Um, just a note here. During 
that commercial break, I downed most of my cup of coffee. So I am going to be talking a little fast on this next part. Now, I don't normally, this is actually, this next part is not about the elections. Well, it might vaguely be about the elections, but it's really not. I want to tell you guys a little story. A little story, personal life. Okay? Want to, want to get a little insight into what goes on here? The House of Porks. Let me, let me explain it. So, the other day, I, uh, wanted to inhale some plants, let's just say. And I didn't have the plants. So I needed to sit in my living room and subject myself to whatever my mother was watching to inhale her plants. Okay. So she, you know, likes Roseanne and misses and is mad that Roseanne got fired, even though every time I explain to her that she's a racist, she says, yeah, I know. But what's the show without her? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's a show about, like, a poor family, and it actually doesn't contain a racist right now. But, so she's like, hey, Jay, you want to watch it? So I'm like, oh, my God. Okay. Okay, so I'll watch it. So, if you didn't watch it, spoilers are coming. I just want to... I don't care about the quality of the comedy. It's not a show I'm probably going to watch. You know? It's not a show I'm going out of my way, appointment television. You know? It's just a regular sitcom. Sitcom stuff. But, killing off Roseanne... ABC had a real chance to tackle an important issue going on in America right now, and that's the opioid crisis. I'm putting that in parentheses because the the overdose of Roseanne on a television show because of the because of opioids that's not the opioid crisis. I'll tell you why. Stick with me, and before you think that I'm insensitive. I just want to tell you that right now, if I went to my 8th grade yearbook, because I didn't graduate high school, so I don't have a high school yearbook, if I go to my 8th grade yearbook right now, and I go through the pictures, I can put an X over about half of my 8th grade class, because they're dead from opioids or heroin Just this week, rest in peace, Richie. I'm not going to say his last name on the podcast. I'm not going to put him on blast. I used to sit with Richie at 8th grade during lunch the entire year. 7th and 8th grade. Kid was in my squad. Like, all of my friends are dying from this. So I'm going to talk to you about it. And you're not going to tell me that I'm being insensitive. Because I know more people who have died from this shit than you have. Okay? I'm in the heart of this. I'm in the heart of this. I can... I I have memories of walking through Tottenville High School. And hanging out with people and seeing people. And they're dead now. I am not old. We did not go to war. You know what I'm saying? There's no reason my friends should be dead. Friends, acquaintances, whatever. There's no reason that that should be a thing. Okay. Now let's get on to the part where you might think I'm insensitive. 65-year-old women... 65-year-old men, old people, getting hooked on opioids and painkillers is not the opioid crisis. I don't want to say nobody cares, because it's not that. But the opioid crisis is when children, children, kids, teenagers, get their hands on opioids, on painkillers, and then start using them for recreation. 
That's the problem. Because if at 15 you are hooked on Oxycontin, by the time you're 19, you are going to need heroin. Because eventually your body becomes... You don't feel it anymore. You build up a tolerance. As with alcohol, with cigarettes, with marijuana, with all that stuff. Nobody. Nobody. Is sitting here thinking, oh man. There's too many old people hooked on opioids right now. They're old. They lived till they're 60, 65. They have the right to get fucked up on painkillers and not feel anything, okay? They have the right. Now, what the Connors could have done, they could have had Roseanne got the painkillers from one of the daughter's friends, one of the granddaughter's friends, the gra uh, Darlene, whatever, Sarah Gilbert's character has two kids on the show. And one, her oldest daughter, who's like, I think, playing like a 16-year-old or whatever, she's in high school. She like got caught shoplifting or something at the, like, she's not a good person, you know what I'm, not, not a good person, but she, you know, runs with the wrong crowd, you know? It could have easily been my friend, you know, Grandma Grandma Rose said, Grammy Rose said she needed this and my friend knew somebody. And then millions of people watching that show would have turned to their kids and had that discussion. But instead, when your kid, when you find your kid has painkillers in his room and opioids and you find him overdosed or you find out he's doing heroin, you're completely clueless on how he got from homework to heroin. And that's parenting. And I understand, like Homer Simpson says, you know, a lot of parenting is placing your kids in front of the television. Well, if you would have sat there with your kid and then a television show brought you a real situation, then maybe you could have spoken to your kid honestly about that. The problem isn't, and yes, overprescription is the problem, overprescribing these things to young, healthy people. That's the key issue. People, children going in their parents' medicine cabinet and taking pills and then bringing them out on the street. Or you have people going to the doctor getting prescribed things they don't need and selling them to drug dealers who then sell them on the street to any Tom, Dick, and Harry that passes by. Age, sex, or location. That's the opioid crisis. Because one day that person on that corner is going to get pinched and they're not going to be there anymore and you're not going to be able to get your painkillers and you're going to be withdrawing and you're going to need a fix. And heroin is going to fix that. There's no 67-year-old women who got hooked on Oxycontin and then found themselves shooting heroin. For the first time ever. I mean, if somebody shot heroin as a youth and went back to it, that's another thing. But what did they do? So how'd Roseanne get the pills? So they're cleaning out her closet and they find painkillers. And, you know, John Goodman... Dan, whatever, he's going nuts. Because it's not her name on the prescription bottle. It's some other, it's a lady. Some old lady. Then later on in the freezer, they find more pills. And they find out that this, you know, she's hiding pills all over the place. Okay. Again, you still got a chance. But what do they do? John Goodman's character is mad at the woman whose name was on the prescription. So he puts up a sign on his car that says such and such killed my wife or well, such and such is a drug dealer or whatever. So eventually this woman has to come to the house and explain, listen, 
you know, insurance premiums are really high. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people can't afford their medication. So a couple of us, you know, women in the neighborhood, like, you know, Susie needed diabetes medicine and I was able to get it for her. So I got it for her. And, you know, if I need something for my, you know, whatever, you know, for my skin, you know, Jillian can get it. So Roseanne came to me needing painkillers. So I was able to help her out because we help each other out because we don't have any money, you know, because in pills, insurance costs us so much money. Prescription medication costs so much that us, the neighborhood watch committee of moms needed to band together and deal drugs to each other. They didn't say deal drugs to each other, but that that's basically what it was. End of the day, Dan accepts it. That's what it is. But that's not a crisis. That's not an opioid crisis. That's a healthcare crisis. That's a, that's a not having health insurance for every American crisis. That's a, our pharmaceutical drug prices are too high crisis. That's a, marijuana is not readily legal in all the states, so people can decide not to do drugs, not to take pills, but instead maybe have their pain subside with marijuana. I'm not a sitcom writer, and I've never read a Sylvia Plath book in my life. But I'm sorry, you missed the point. You know how many people were watching that? I, I, even I was, and I didn't want to. It was on DVR, but it counts towards the ratings, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure they figured out that DVRing things counts as watching it. You had a chance to spark up a conversation at every dinner table. You had a, con you had a chance to spark up a conversation in front of every television set. And the conversation you chose to spark up is that, you know, for lack of a better term, the rent is too damn high. That's not it. That's not the opioid crisis. Now, some people might say, Jay, you know, they weren't trying to address the opioid crisis. They were killing off Roseanne and that's what they did. And they did it how they did it. All right, cool, fine. But just understand that ABC is owned by Disney. Disney World. Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse ain't gonna have any customers if kids keep dying from getting their parents' painkillers. My cousin got married in Disney World. Destination Wedding. I personally wasn't a fan because I was 15 and I was an obnoxious piece of garbage. Or I was 16. I was a real obnoxious piece of shit. I, I really, I mean, really, I just, I got to apologize to all of them again, like my whole family for that weekend. That was the worst. I was so, I was such an obnoxious piece of garbage. But like, there's not going to be many destination weddings if people keep dying from heroin overdoses and overdoses from opioids. And the way you do that is to get out in front of the problem. Especially here on Staten Island. Tons of opioid deaths. Too many. We used to have a district attorney. Our old district attorney back in the day, a couple of years ago, maybe, you know, when I was a teenager, there used to be this drug task force. And he disbanded it. And then he ran for Congress. And he took money from pharmaceutical companies. From pharmaceutical super PACs. That guy is Dan Donovan. And he's up for election in NY11, New York 11, Staten Island and some of Brooklyn, November 6th. And we could replace him with Max Rose. Max Rose, who, while Dan Donovan was doing all this stuff, disbanding the drug task force making it harder for people to stay on top of the opioid, cri the real opioid crisis that is hitting teens and young adults. Could have curbed that, but instead got rid of his drug task force 
And all while Max Rose was in Afghanistan defending his country. November 6th, we fix this. Okay. I'm done. Was that... Did I explain that Roseanne death thing right? Because I was trying to have the conversation with my dad the other day, and I was like, I think I need to have a conversation like three or four times before I actually comprehend it. Like, I was doing the trial run yesterday in the car, and I, I didn't feel like I was making sense. Did I just make sense? I made sense, right? Well, if I didn't, get at me, at Jay Parks on Twitter. As I'm sure you will. <laughs> Hate mail is something I get a lot more these days. Because I'm the lonely liberal. Shaolin liberals. Shaolibs. That's what I am. I'm a Shaolib. Living in North Texas. Okay. Let's get up on out of here. But before we do, let me give you a couple of websites that you can go to that, you know, help keep me in business. First of all, there is ConcertConfessions.com. That's where you're going to get all your live music news and reviews for the fans by the fans. Our buddy Miz out of California, Tarantula Man Photography on on Facebook. Go like the page. He's coming out with some epic stuff out of Cali, man. Epic pics. Almost, you know, a couple of times a week. I wish I could be hitting that many shows. But it is all at ConcertConfessions.com. The new look, ConcertConfessions.com. And if you go to a show and you want to, like, share your concert experience, hit me up. Let me know. I will make that happen for you. You can join the family. Also need to go to patreon.com forward slash jporks, become a least coast radio head, support the podcast in any way you could. And if you do that, if you're a least coast radio head, you find yourself receiving bonus content weekly. There'll be opportunities to get the podcast a day early. You get mailed personalized artwork. And you can even connect personally with me. J Porks. Slide in my DMs. Call me up on the phone. Literally, there are several, several different levels of becoming a Least Coast Radiohead. And if you go to patreon.com forward slash J Porks, you can figure out what that's all about. And, uh, every week when we have music headlines, if, if we ever do again, we ever talk about music again the headlines will be powered by antiquiet antiquiet.com is your source for quality and go check out the aq podcast until next week folks wacky weed and warren zevon resist remove and fight for recreational j pawks j pawks podcast exclusively on Lee's Coast Radio. Late. If you don't know what Staten Island is, it's like New York's abortion that lived. Representing Staten Island. Staten Island was no joke.